Dr. Homebrew is brought to you by Five Star Chemicals, providing safety and cleaning supplies for brewing, distilling, and winemaking at fivestarchemicals.com. Dr. Luck. Stand aside, nurse. I'm Dr. Homebrew. I'm a singer. I'm singing songs to you guys. Singing the intro song. And uh, it has no real lyrics. It just changes all the time. Most of the time, there is no song. That's the kind of song that you like for me to hear. Or I did like say. the Dr. Homebrew. <laughs> it's my doctor. Dr. Homebrew. It's the Dr. Homebrew. He's my primary <laughs> care physician. Yeah. He gets but, me drunk all the time. Yeah. Not a good golfer, but he's a good friend. <laughs> anyway, it's Dr. Homebrew, of course. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And uh, we have some beers for you today. We have a cream ale, which we don't get very often. Yeah. And I really appreciate the fact that we have one today. It's a classic style show today. Yeah. We don't have eight IPAs to drink. It's uh, very refreshing. And... The second part of the refreshing spectrum, we have a Meriton. Again. Yeah. Barrel aged? What the heck is going on? <laughs> right. No barrels. I'm leaving. No hops. You should leave. That's Oh, here, I got you on the wrong thing. Sorry, dude. There you go. Um, no problem. I'll just talk into this other microphone. There we go. I, hey, hey. Where hey, are you hey. even? Okay, you're right there. All right. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple good uh, beers for you guys, and I'm excited about that. But uh, I'm even more excited about this show being brought to you by Five Star Chemicals. Lovely people at Five Star Chemicals will help you make better beer by teaching you how to properly sanitize and clean, but in the reverse order. You have to clean it, and then you sanitize it. Um, That's what you got to do. Sorry. That's prevailing science, people. That's science we're talking about right now. Why do I got a thing in here? (laughs) Gross. Uh, Yeah, so the good people at Five Star... They know about science, and they teach you about science, and then you can make better beer. And then, uh, you know, there you go. I was using Five Star uh, all weekend. I was brewing, actually brewed a couple batches and, um, you know, cleaned out a couple growlers with all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, it gets used not just for, for brewing. If you have growlers and bottles and all that kind of stuff, man, uh, you, can't go, you can't go wrong with Five Star. Or if you're lazy and leave your bottles sitting around for a year before you clean them. <laughs> like, How do you guys uh, feel about cleaning baby bottles with, with Star Sand products? I'm sure it's fine, right? Yeah. I don't know. What do you will you tell me? I don't I don't think I'm allowed to right now. It's something I considered. <laughs> uh, breaking out the keg washer and throwing it. I'm yeah. just kidding. Uh, you don't, don't you you haven't uh, you haven't tried it yet. No, I don't think I'm allowed to do that. Really? Like uh, allowed by uh, the wife or allowed in some sort of like the state? <laughs> yeah, some sort of state uh, it's thing. The former, but it kind, yeah? of, kind of feels like the latter sometimes. But I'm just, kidding, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is she going like I don't really think that that's a good idea for our baby and like that? She doesn't sound like that, but yeah. <laughs> Just the general. Like, hey, it's the gen- hey, don't do that. Yeah, that is wrong in every every way. Hey, if you're listening, I, I love you, honey. So uh. I think I would I would I would use it. I would do like on glass, you know, and, and any any glass baby stuff that you want to clean and sanitize. But then I would rinse it just to you know. So it's the water instead of the acid. Even though it's a no rinse sanitizer for yeah. a baby, just just to be safe, just to be safe. But well, I would, you, I would have no hesitation. How else are you going to clean that stuff? I don't know. I don't. Know. I don't it I mean, seems don't. like a new market for for you know for you know PBW for example. It seems like it's got <laughs> something else they can break into and you know and, and start selling. Yeah. Uh, you know, five star start selling to, to, to Fi- baby baby star baby parents. Yeah, yeah, baby that'll star. be called baby star. Baby star exactly. Uh, well, let's get our first guy on the phone here. Uh, the phone number disappeared, so i got to find it again. Uh, we're going to be talking to Rich, and he's going to, I think his beer was the Meriton. I mean, I, I know it was. 
So uh, let's let's get the Meriton on deck here for for him, and uh, we will talk to Rich about his Meriton. He also has a couple other beers that we're going to talk to him about next month. Uh, he did like a party guile uh, thing, and uh, so we're going to have a, a sweet stout, I think, and uh, I forget what else. Cool. Anyway, Rich, are you there? Hey, I'm here. What's up? What, what's going on, man? How you doing? Oh, you know, just hanging out in uh, Scranton. Just keeping it real out there. Oh, East Coaster. Right. Well, I appreciate that very much, man. Uh, we're pouring your beer. Uh, it's the Meriton, right? We'll make sure you got the right one. Yep. Uh, mine's a cream ale. It's the oh. cream ale. Oh, okay. Well, see, there you go. Um, yep. So let's pour the cream ale. My bad. I can, That's all right. The other guy has a has an R in his name, I think, and I, get, I got you guys confused, <laughs> so my bad. It's um, Richie Rich show. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, while we get the cream mail port, see, I'm glad I checked and wasn't going to double check. I wasn't going to double check, <laughs> awesome. and you guys yeah. are going to be like reading the key, and then Rich is like, what the <laughs> yeah. fuck are you guys doing? So tell us about your recipe. Why did you put all this Munich malt in your cream <laughs> ale? What's wrong? <laughs> um, so let's just start it off like we always do. How long have you been a home brewer, man? Uh, I've been brewing for about two years now, almost two years. Okay, almost two years. And uh, is cream ale something you've tackled before, or is this a brand new uh, try at this? Um, yeah, this is, so this is the second version of uh, cream ale. This is actually the first style that I've been kind of trying to, I guess, master. Um, okay. Drew, uh, Drew and Denny had a podcast, or Drew had a podcast on it a while back, and then a uh, brewery here in Houston makes a pretty good cream ale, so I just... I like the style. Okay, I I appreciate it, man. Anybody who's not trying to perfect an IPA, I'm I'm all right with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you make this recipe up yourself? Um, I did. I mean, I basically took a you know the standard eighty percent, or I guess I won't talk about the recipe too much, but um, just the basic uh, base malt and corn, and just threw some yeast in there. So pretty easy. Trying to decide between the six row and two row, so I'll let you guys. I don't know. Guess which one this is. <laughs> Our trained professionals will will help you along. Guess that mold. in any way they can. Uh, okay, very good. Well, we'll let uh, Brian start us off because he's closer to me. <laughs> oh wow, man! I thought we were close, JP. Way to go! Not emotionally. Oh, oh, he can okay. reach out and strangle me if I don't. Emotionally, uh, I love you guys the same. Talk enough on the show. Which is very little, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, aroma wise, in the beer, I'm getting a low. Uh, just a low maltiness, kind of a bready with a you know corn like note as expected. Um, there's a medium low but noticeable uh, buttery diacetyl in there that's kind of detracting from the style, and low earthy floral hop, and moderately low fruity esters. I found uh, not standing out too much. Uh, no acid aldehyde. Just um, yeah, a little bit of a little bit of butter in there. Uh, artificial popcorn butter smell. <laughs> Appearance-wise, it's a brilliantly clear uh, yellow-gold colored body to the beer with a low white head, fine bubbles. It fades uh, a little while after pouring. Uh, it stuck around for a little bit, but uh, the, the glass where we have here just kind of dropped after a while to a little collar of some fine foam ringing the glass. But I, I gave it... F actually, it's maybe a little towards the darker end for the style. It's kind of a yellowy gold. You could go a little lighter with it. It's kind of, you know, you want to go kind of... Pale straw to through yellow to maybe a moderate gold color. I guess it's it's in there for me toward the darker end, but low, uh, yeah. So flavor wise, it's got a medium uh, bread malt quality. Uh, again, a low corn like DMS, which is okay for the style. It's coming through a little bit. You know, the corn is definitely nice and heavy in this, and and the DMS is is pretty noticeable. So. You know, it's it's definitely in there alongside the again in the flavor. I get it, a medium low diastole kind of invading everything else. Um, mm -hmm. Low bitterness, uh, medium earthy floral, uh, hop aroma, and um, the smell is slightly to the malt. I found, but but there's there's a fair amount of hop in there too. Finishes medium dry, and um, yeah, I get you know a little bit of hop, a little bit of malt, and a little bit of diacetyl in the aftertaste it's not it's not a real heavy diacetyl but it's just enough to to give the, an edge to that that um the finish and the and the, you know what, what should other otherwise have there which seems like pretty good ingredients and everything um the medium light body on the mouthfeel uh medium carbonation no warmth a light slickness on the tongue from the diacetyl and it's 
it's actually even despite that it's, it's still slightly creamy smooth which is you know one of the hallmarks of the style it's a cream ale um you know it should be nice creamy smooth and go down easy and, and it does uh and and there's no astringency in the way here either so that's that's nice um you know, it's a, it's a seemingly well brewed cream ale with with a good recipe. It's just getting that the one uh, main defect in, in the diacetyl. So, uh, you know, the DMS is maybe a bit high for the style. I can forgive that. That's it's it's nice and corn like. I'd like to, yeah. you know, um, taste what it was was like without what it would be like without the the light butteriness to it. And I think it would express itself in a pretty nice balance um so yeah for the dash i'll just give it a nice rest after primary don't pull out off the yeast too soon hold it in the higher 60s for two to three days after fermentation is completely finished and um you know for the dms use a good strong rolling boil you can extend your boil a little bit to 90 minutes if you want to drop that down a little bit with the open lid of course uh to reduce that dms but again that was not too bad i i scored the beer at a 25 i felt that the the, the buttery flaw was a, enough to to detract a, a fair amount from the the quality of the beer, and I I'd like to it's it's well brewed otherwise, so I I'd really like to um, see it give it another try. And uh, but yeah, if there's any other balance um, things we can get to to kind of help you dial it in, and and definitely solving the the diacetyl thing, um, we'll we'll go there. But yeah, I'll I'll let uh, Keith chime in with his thoughts over here. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. I don't have any. I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you can borrow it, some. It is. Very, I mean, my, my score sheet is very similar to yours, Brian. Um, on the, the aroma, low malt corn, uh, medium buttered popcorn, which is diacetyl. Get a faint spicy hop aroma. Just a low pear apple ester. Um, everything pretty much appropriate except for the diacetyl. Um, and also getting a little bit of alcohol on the on the, the nose as well. Uh, medium deep gold. I I would say it, it almost falls a, a little bit outside the style guideline. It's more, you know, it says gold for the, the guideline. I think this is a little bit on the deep side uh, for that, but you know, right at the, right at the edge there. Not not that big of a deal. Um, the head was a little bit low. Uh, even I poured it again now. There's not much. Uh, there's there's a ring around the glass, but beyond that, not a lot of head retention. Um, which is interesting, I think, with something like a, a six-row malt, I would expect a little more head retention. I'd be interested in hearing about your mash procedure and you know what you're doing there, uh, going through uh, you know the regimen there you're using. Uh, carbonation looks a little on the low side for the style. Um, sweet, okay, flavor-wise, sweet malt up front, light DMS corn, also getting that buttered popcorn, uh, but I thought it was lower in the flavor than the aroma. Uh, picking up some hop flavor. I was getting a little more hop flavor than I was in the aroma. thought it was uh, light citrus, so a little bit of spiciness there as well. Uh, balance is toward the malt, but uh, I thought it was a little sweeter and even a little bit more bitter than the style dictate. Tates, uh, and I was getting a light solvent and just a uh, some once again hints of apples, uh, esters uh, in it. Uh, medium body. I don't know. Brian said medium light. I thought it was on the medium side. Uh, you know, which is also again on the high end for the style. Low warming uh, carb was medium low. I thought it was a little low for the style as well. It's a little more, a little more spritz in a cream ale. It should be a pretty. Light drinking beer with a good, good level of carbonation. Um, <laughs> excuse me, uh, hoppy. I thought it was a hop, hoppy in terms of flavor for the for the style. Uh, I'd, like, I'd cut that back a little bit. I thought a little more body than it would. Maybe that's just a fermentation thing, uh, being able to ferment it out a little bit drier. But I think, like Brian said, for me the biggest detractor really was that that diacetyl. Uh, where it sits right now, even with the diacetyl removed, I thought maybe it would do better as a blonde ale than a cream ale, although it does have that DMS corn-like character, which would probably not make it fit so well as a blonde either. So I would look into, <laughs> look into cleaning up the diacetyl and getting it to be a little bit, a little bit drier. Uh, overall, um, and uh, you know, I'm just interested in knowing what you did with the yeast and just you know, handling and, and and things like that. Okay. And I gave it a 26. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot all about that. I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> score. <laughs> we score these things. Yeah, I could see the Blondale thing again, but yeah, the corn, yeah. the corn, in, corniness would be detracting from that. I like the fl- yeah. I, mean, I, I like the the, the flavor of there's. I get definitely the DMS in the aroma, but. 
the 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 I guess the corn flavor and the the body just it it's not offensive. It's like I'm, nice, I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty rich. <laughs> like yeah, there's a it lot of really is corn yeah. flavor to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, about uh, this beer there, Rich? What your recipe was and your process and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so I, this is actually the two row beer. Um, so I had a nine and a quarter pounds of two row, and then a pound and a quarter of flaked corn. Uh, so about eighty twenty there for the percentage. Um, and then for the hops, I did an ounce of Liberty at sixty minutes and an ounce of Liberty at five minutes. Uh, and a I wrote down a seventy minute boil. I think I did seventy. I may have done sixty. I don't quite remember. Uh, then it was uh, Nottingham dry, um, just fit straight in there. And I did um, 58 degrees and then raised it to about 65. So I probably could have raised it a little higher, I guess, for the diacetyl rest um, for a few days. It actually didn't finish as low as I wanted. It was uh, supposed to go down to 1010, and it finished around 1014. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's probably a little sweeter. Yeah, um, I, I think yeah. I think one of the things too. You know, you said you raised it to sixty five. You know, like Brian mentioned, the high sixties is better, and it's also good to sort of catch it on okay. the tail end of fermentation. Uh, I'm not sure when you when you mm-hmm. raised it, but like you don't want to you know raise it when it's kind of done, and and you can it'll kind of work that way, but it'll work a lot better and get a lot drier if you catch it in the last like while it's still fermenting before it's all the way done. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's gonna, actually a good idea. Yeah, you're not going to pick up a ton of esters from doing it that way. Um, most of the esters are formed early in fermentation, so I think that was a pretty smart plan to start low, like you did at 58, uh, and then sort of ramp from there. Um, but yeah, you'd want to make sure that while it's still fermenting, you sort of catch that tail end of fermentation and, and bump it up. And I would go for something like Nottingham. You know, maybe I'm not. A, I don't know a ton about Nottingham. I probably used it once or twice in my life, maybe. But I, w- I would say, yeah, even for that, I would. You know, 68 is probably fine. Getting it up there while. Well, it's tail, near the tail end. And it, being that you made this twice and you made it now, you can kind of even gauge, write down some notes and say, hey, uh, it took seven days to ferment. Maybe on day five next time I should. And not every fermentation is going to be the same either. But on day five next time is when I should start ramping up the temperature. And how do you how do you ramp up cool. temperature? What do you have? How do you do control-wise? How, do, how are you able to do, this, do so? Yeah, so that's the tricky part. And I've actually kind of been working on it. So I'm a, I'm a pilot, so I'll, I'll brew these on my days off and then I pretty much cool them, pitch the yeast and I have to walk away for about, you know, five days or so. Um, or fly away maybe? <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. Fly yeah, sometimes they, sometimes they don't start taking off until maybe the third day that I'm actually gone, the second day that I'm actually gone. So I actually came up with a temperature controller that I can now control anywhere from my phone. So oh, nice. I can... <laughs> Mid-flight. And start, <laughs> what, uh, what did you do? <laughs> Um, I have a, I mess around with microcontrollers, and so I have one hooked up to my Wi-Fi at the house. And then I have a, an, an app, Blink is an app that talks to these microcontrollers. So I coded, just wrote some code so I can add a little slider and the display that shows what temperature it's currently at. So wow. I have it hooked up to a relay so I can move the temperature around. It's basically an ink bird that I can control from wherever. Damn. Nice. It's like it's nothing. I just wrote some code and just did the Fogelheim <laughs> theory, and just it was fine. It's it's kind of funny. We, uh, I, you know, I I grew up in Pittsburgh and was in a homebrew club there, and we had three people in the club that were who were pilots, and it was always kind of one of those weird things. Like, hey, how is a pilot a a home brewer sort of thing? But it, it was just you know they, I don't know why it just sort of worked out that way. Maybe just your interests and I don't know getting deep into something. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm assuming if you're a pilot, obviously you know a lot about planes and, and you know, get, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair assumption. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I don't know, like, it's kind of like, you're not at the, you're not at the surface level of airplanes. Yeah. You're just like, yeah, Bro, whatever. I'm just going to no jump in. I'm just going to jump in and hit the, hit these couple buttons. Yeah. Or, you know, so. I mean, I know, I know like what the switch does, but how the fuck does a plane stay in the air? I have no idea, but all aboard. Let's go. Uh, well, do you have any questions? I wonder the same thing sometimes. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have any questions for uh, for the guys on on how to you know do something uh, different or, or what, change anything? Yeah. Or? What, are you, what are your thoughts on diastole? You think it's just the temperature or um, not ramping uh, up? At the yeah, end, I, I think uh, probably not ramping it high enough. Um, yeah, because I mean, like like I said, and and probably what you guys said is like I kind of walked away from it, and it was pretty much finished by the time I did start ramping temp up. So that's probably a little late for the dash rest so i'll start doing it sooner and, so it uh, took, um, took off so yeah. and everything you you had a good starter and got it going it cool. did, yeah it took off within um i'd say within 18 hours it was it was going pretty good so yeah 
do you, do you ex- exclusively um, use dry yeast, or do you do you uh, use liquid yeast at all and make starters? Or I think you can make great beer with dry yeast. I'm just wondering, you know, um, have you experienced I, this before I with this yeast strain? Use, I just decided on Nottingham because I well, I just read that Nottingham is a good yeast, and I went to the homebrew shop and they only had Nottingham in, in dry. They didn't have any uh, WLP Nottingham, and um, actually the third version, which is about to be kegged right now, I put. 005 in, which was, now I realize it's a mistake because it doesn't taste like the same beer at all. Um, but it's just way more fruity. So I'll probably go with a Kolsch yeast on the next one just to try it out. 05 is the British yeah. ale? Yeah. yeah. That might be a good way uh, to go. 05 is the British ale, yeah. Yeah, I almost, I was guessing yeah, that British good. ale on this one even when you when I tasted it, I was thinking maybe it's a British ale that, that you know, some of the British ales throw off more diacetyl yeah, than the, other beers, but yeah. Right, the East Train, sorry. and the 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 one in, in the keg right now is is uh, it's pretty fruity because of the British ale, and yeah, it's it's I'm not a big fan of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, is that uh, if that's it? I think we'll we'll let you you go. I think so. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for sending. Thanks, it man. Me. I appreciate it, and um, we'll uh, we'll talk later. I don't know what right, I mean. That thanks. sounds very <laughs> ominous. And Keep like, on the brewing, yeah. Let us know the next one. come up. We'll chat later. Don't worry thanks, about Rich. it. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> Cheers. All right, thanks, guys. All right, later. I, yeah, I like I liked the beer. I think it, it has a really deep flavor. It has a lot. And I don't know. I don't have too much experience with cream ales because really the only ones that I've ever had are kind of out here. And I think on the West, on the East Coast, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's more of a cultural thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I I I, I like it. It tastes like uh, if someone said, "Here's a craft cream ale." This is what I would I would expect. Just kind of more bold flavor. I used to drink a fair amount of cream ale. I you know I was mentioning earlier that uh, when my some, someone in my family would die, we would get a keg of Genesee cream ale. I'm not sure why, but that's always that always was the case. And then in, in Ohio, I used to drink Little King's cream ale, and they used to sell it in, in cases in the little seven ounce bottles. And I you know this is when I was in college. I would polish off a. A case by myself in one night, but it was you know the seven ounce bottles, so it was still a lot, a decent <laughs> amount of beer, but yeah. it still wasn't like you know like it, was, it was always fun like going to the store and buying this case of beer with little seven ounce bottles in it and just mm. like just throwing them back in two sips or whatever. You know, right, quality, <laughs> quality like, drinking um, back then. I thought you were just so, such a baller. You're like, dude, case <laughs> cases of beer, bro, this weekend. Looks like White Ale makes a cream ale yeast, a WP080. That could be. I wonder a, if that's a blend of a lager try. and ale, or what they're. I don't know. Fat. Yeah, it's, mm. it is a blend of ale and lager. Yeah, yeah. It's a blend of ale and, and lager strains. That's interesting. You do need something that's going to tolerate those lower temperatures and and do well and power through it for you. Mm. And and when in doubt, pitch <laughs> pitch more. Get it happy <laughs> with a starter. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we are going to take a break here and get our second brewer on. Which, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, is a Mertzen. <laughs> It is going to be a Mertzen. Mertzen. I think, yeah. All right. But before we do, uh, I want to let you guys know about the free Brew Guru app. Of course, it's built from the uh, by the American Homebrew Association, so it's built by homebrewers and for homebrewers and beer lovers and everybody. You don't need to be a homebrewer to download the Brew Guru app. But basically, you tool around town wherever you are, and the Brew Guru app will alert you to a good beer bar or a brewery around the corner that you had no idea existed. It's great for travelers. It's great for people who want to just get out of town and see new stuff. Uh, but if you are an AHA member, you can attach your AHA membership card to it in the app, and then you can go around and get all sorts of discounts at all these places because it will show you where which places have these discounts. You can also get free Zymergy articles and all that kind of fun stuff. So it's a Brew Guru app. It's totally free, so you don't got to pay a darn thing for it. A lot like this show. Okay, we'll be right back uh, with a Mertzen. This is Dr. Homebrew. Stay tuned. Hello, fellow BNers. This is Sully from the 21st Amendment Brewery located in San Francisco, just two blocks from Giants Park. Before Nico and I opened the 21A and before I was a professional brewer, I homebrewed on my small four-burner apartment stove in a back house in Santa Monica, California, making my extract brews before graduating to the daunting idea of all-grain brewing. Homebrew books and information was hard to come by back then. The Internet hadn't been invented yet, along with other things we take for granted today, like electricity and potable water. One thing I wish I had back then when I was learning was a radio show that could teach me the ins and outs of brewing and answer questions that I had about homebrewing, a resource for making great craft beer. The 21st Amendment Brewery is excited to be a proud sponsor of Dr. Homebrew. 
a great show that teaches you what you need to know about making incredible beer. Good stuff. Listen up. You might learn something. I certainly did. And thanks for your support. Tasty Crack Games. Since the first time the Brewing Network microphones turned on, more beer was behind it. More Beer sponsors the programming on the BN because, like you, they love brewing. And like the Brewing Network, they love sharing their knowledge. Morebeer.com isn't just a website to place your next equipment or ingredient order. Morebeer.com also gives you access to free beer information that will make you a better brewer. Go to morebeer.com and click into the Learning Center. You'll find podcasts, technical facts, video tutorials, and more, including access to The Buzz, More Beer's social network of more than 5,000 members. And some of them might even be crazier about beer than you are. Get over to morebeer.com today and take advantage of The Buzz, The Forum, The Learning Center, and make sure you're signed up to receive the newest More Beer catalog. More Beer, bringing you absolutely everything for beer making. Now, back to the examination. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. Drinking some of this cream ale here. Before we get to our next guest, I want to tell you guys about Grog Tag. The fine people at Grog Tag, they want to let you know that Grog Tag is more than just the place for great reusable beer labels. They have a lot of cool stuff for your home brewery metal signs, tap handles, tasting mats, and more. All customizable and all made for you by fellow home brewers. So stop handing out blank bottles to people, and for the love of brewing, stop serving your beer from faucets with masking tape on the tap handles. Get your custom needs met over at grogtag.com. Use code BNARMY, that's B-N-A-R-M-Y, to grab 10% off of your order at checkout. Grogtag.com. Yeah, they're um, and they're giving away some stuff for that uh, the AHA label contest that's going that's on right, right now, too. And you got a couple um, more days to enter that. Yeah, yeah. Man, get into that. That's they always exciting, support man. that kind of stuff. I'm yeah, happy they support us. Yeah, they're great. Uh, they support homebrewing a lot. And, and their labels uh, are cool. Their labels <laughs> the are signs, cool, man. all that. Yeah, they do a good job. We got a tap handle made for our, our competition through them oh, nice. for the, the best of show prize instead of a stupid plaque that, you know, Keith is just going to hang on his wall. I never, <laughs> I never I still, bothered to I collect still, it. I still don't have it. Yeah. yeah. See, what the Keith hell? doesn't care. He doesn't, doesn't care about anything. Yeah. Uh, Brian, you there, bud? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, we got you. How you doing, man? Right on. I'm doing pretty good. Another Brewer Brian. Just to make sure you have the merits in, right? Yeah, that's my <laughs> Okay, no, good. No, man, mine was cream ale. I was like, no. <laughs> God, I'm stupid. Uh, anyway, Brian, uh, we'll get to your uh, your merits in here in a sec, but how long have you been home brewing, my friend? Yeah, I just looked back. It's been five years or so. Oh, really? You said you just switched back? Did you stop? No, well, I just looked back at my old notes to figure out what oh. it was. And okay. It's been five years, and I think this is my 28th batch. So, you know, a few wow. times here and there a year. Yeah, that's not bad, man. That's not bad. Have you Had you tried a Meriton before, or is this your first crack at it? No, it was my first try. My first lager yeah. to do. So oh, it's really? It's fun to see what you guys think about it. Cool, man. I, and I don't know why. I like asking that question. I think it's kind of fun to know how long people have been brewing and and if they've tried a recipe for the first time or not i think that's yeah, i don't know yeah. it's just kind of fun because that's what we do and yeah, if you've lagered fun. yeah lagering for the first time that's a big deal too yeah were you nervous about it um i don't know i <laughs> just didn't care Whatever. all right i'll just do try it. out of beer so if yeah. it's good or not i don't know <laughs> don't be nervous just jump in you don't hold a lot of emotion internally like i do apparently because <laughs> <laughs> i think like, it's well, I don't know. internally <laughs> 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 it's it's about it. what do you mean? In my mind, but. it'll take i mean it took me like eight years to try a fucking lager because i'm like i don't know it's just i, I, I what if it what if it's just not good and what if meanwhile everything's infected here and there and, and a pile so. of chewed off fingernails landed in the beer yeah right I don't know. I find I've listened to a lot of the podcast about uh, doing the fast logger method, so that's why oh. I did with this one because I just don't have the patience to wait such a long time. I don't think. Oh. Yeah. Okay. There goes well, ten points off your beer right now. Yeah. Of <laughs> You're lucky. I'm not judging you. Fast logger. Oh. <laughs> uh, but uh, hey, man, maybe uh, maybe you'll be the first homebrew that I've had with the fast logger method that tastes good. I'm just kidding. Um, 
All right, uh, Keith, let's go. You're up, and you're the first boy. <clears throat> you're okay. the first man child. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, bottle inspection, I noticed there's raised lettering. Uh, just to call that out. Uh, <laughs> some competitions are cool with that, others are not. Brian and I were. Is our competition cool? Yeah, with we were it? like, let's. let's do we really want to judge this or not? I'm not sure what we're going to do. <laughs> Keith was it about back. ready to dump it on the floor. Yeah, dump it on the floor. Oh, and he was like, no, that's not, there's, there's carpeting in here. Can you let's imagine just, if we did that? If let's we're just taste like, it. Yeah, sorry, Brian. Look, we can't, we, we're not going to judge your beer. Why? Because it has a raised lettering on the neck and we're dicks. <laughs> the principle of the thing. <laughs> yeah. But that could be DQ'd in a comp. So, yeah, just watch out. Yeah, some some true. Some don't, well, yeah. we won't let it color our impressions. Anyway, moving on from there at a medium high malt intensity biscuit. Uh, toasty, lots of breadiness with a medium low spicy hop aroma. Thought the the aroma was a little bit higher. Th- I'm sorry, the hop aroma was a little bit higher than the style dictated, but uh, just got a hint of an apple wester. Otherwise, it was super clean, no diacetyl, no, no diacetyl, no acid aldehyde, uh, nothing phenolic, nothing off. So uh, gave that a ten out of twelve. Appearance: it was an orangey, coppery color with very low head retention, uh, but. You know, just a little white head around the, the glass, but otherwise, you know, beautifully beautiful in clarity. Otherwise, really a great appearance other than the low head retention. Flavor-wise, big mulliness, uh, bread crust biscuit, but not overly sweet. Balances toward malt. Hot bitterness is medium low, medium low ester. Lester again. This is a uh, apple, um, super clean. Otherwise, nothing nothing off other than that 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 light apple ester. Uh, the hot f- flavor was barely detectable. A little bit of spiciness. Uh, I thought the finish was a, a, a bit sharp. And, uh, you know, in the style guidelines, it talks about lingering maltiness. I thought, you know, kind of kind of, kind of quick finish there. It didn't really have a lot of lingering mal- maltiness. But otherwise, I really liked the um, sort of the, the balance and the, the finish aftertaste other than just sort of the, the, the kind of the the sharpness uh mouthfeel medium body medium high carbonation uh crisp with a low warming uh definitely not cloying in any way and finally uh said dan this was a super tasty beer i even wrote the word damn down (laughs) Uh, damn love the malt with the low sweetness so i love the the, you know your, your ability to get the great maltiness in there but not have it be overly sweet um, I think that that balance is really awesome. Um, there's not a ton I can give you in terms of improving, other than just sort of uh, asking some questions about the you know the slight esters. How are you know how are your what's your fermentation? What's your yeast handling? Pitching rates? Uh, fermentation procedure? Those are probably the only thing I had questions about. Just that slight apple appleness. And you know Brian and I chatted a little bit about it, and we, you know I was like, well maybe he's like maybe it's the Munich malt. And now that we've hmm. heard your uh, explanation, maybe it's the the quick. Uh, lager fermentation. No, I'm, um, I'm kidding. But uh, overall, I gave it a 40. I thought it was a really, really great beer. Um, you know, really impressed. This is your first lager, and and you know, both from a uh, procedure perspective and a uh, recipe perspective, I think it's pretty spot on. Excellent. All right, Brian, well, you're <clears throat> up there, Holmes. Well done, young Padawan. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is. At least he's uh, not a youngling, because then you'd slay him. Yeah, in the room, so six day Mertzen. So, yeah, um, in the aroma, medium, toasty, and crusty Munich malt aromas. Fairly clean lager profile. Definitely just, um, yeah, smooth. No hops noted. Um, no obvious fruity esters. But, it, like, I got a slight kind of a apricot-like note and a faint cherry-like, which I thought was probably coming from the malt. Um, no DMS or diacetyl, anything like that in there. Just clean. Appearance-wise, it's a burnt orangey amber color with uh, excellent clarity. Poured ahead of fine off-white bubbles that just uh, stuck around only briefly. That just kind of zip. And a little collar around the glass. Fine, fine bubbles. But, uh, yeah, at least it wasn't a frothy mess when you poured it. It's, you know, it seemed like a nice, it's always nicely, <laughs> nicely formed head. Usually the tighter the bubbles you get, the better uh, the quality of the beer. But... Um, yeah, it just it just faded. There's some some things you can do to fix that, but uh, some of the tricks you might not want to use because it wouldn't be classic <laughs> for the style. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, flavor wise, I, I I enjoyed the flavor a lot. It has a pleasant, bready, toasty, and bread crust like malt profile. Uh, definitely up front. 
low bitterness is out of the way and uh, kind of a low floral and spicy hop flavor just enough to balance skin check uh, and a clean lager ferment with a nice dry finish uh, no no bad stuff from DMS etc um, it's not super sulfury the um, you know the, the bread crust like malt sticks through into the aftertaste which is nice and just kind of lingers on the tongue for a while and in the mouthfeel, it's it's a medium bodied and, and smooth. It's actually very easy easy drinking beer. Uh, medium low carbonation. I thought you know, these said, Keith said medium high, and but yeah, I don't know. It's it seems maybe it's somewhere around medium, <laughs> one side or the other. No astringency, fairly creamy impression actually, and and uh, didn't get any any warmth or anything in there that would, that would be inappropriate. But uh, yeah. So I thought the the carbonation, I don't know, with the head the way it fell and then that, I thought maybe the carbonation was a bit low. I'm not getting a lot in there, but I mean, it's, there's definitely some to it. It's not it's not flat. <laughs> um, overall, very pleasant drinking Meritzen. Uh, just has just about all the desired elements you want in that beer. Um, the malt shines through nicely. Can improve the head retention. Uh, you know, there's <laughs> the, the typical trick is well, you know, throw a, a quarter pound of, of uh, wheat malt in there, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that'll that'll fix it. But yeah, that's yeah, well. That in this case, I, mean, I know it's a thing, but is that a thing that works? It does work, but it I does. don't think it would be appropriate for this beer. I don't want to give it a weedy flavor, and I mean, it's a little bit wouldn't hurt it, but yeah, you could do a carafoam. Um or carapils, it's a little yeah, sweeter, and that might blend bit, in a little bit better. But I mean, carafoam is supposed to help with head retention as yeah. well, so I think that's, yeah. all, that's what I use a lot. But uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in hearing about the, uh, the, the you know the mash regimen because it's like, well, why is the head retention so low? Like, what are you what are you doing? Um, in, yeah. In, in, in that, you know, regards to that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a malty beer. Hops are are, are something to build the head. Um, True. You know, wheat malt or carafoam would be a good trick. Uh, so yeah, um, just good you know good brewing practice. If you're doing a, a protein rest or something that's not unnecessary, you want to just keep some of those some of those proteins in there through to the finish and not break them all down. So um, you know if your your malt is really well modified and you're doing an extra protein rest for no reason, you could omit that. But it I don't know it doesn't sound like you probably did that. <laughs> But anyway, I gave the beer a um, a forty also, and I uh, thought it was very very pleasant for the style. Um, it's a little even a little rich for the style. It's like a big mm-hmm. big Meritzen. Yeah. But um, you know, it still plays that that nice crisp dryness with the you know uh, <coughs> graham cracker and bread crust malts in there, just kind of playing off each other nicely, and and uh, yeah, nice balance for the beer for sure. Excellent. All right. Um, so, do you have any questions for uh, for the guys, or maybe we should just get into the recipe first and kind of go from there? Sure. If you want that, and I got questions yeah. or whatever. But you want to do the recipe? Yeah, let's do the recipe first, Brian. Why not? All right. So it was forty three percent Munich two, thirty nine percent Pilsner, seventeen percent Vienna, and point four percent Carafa. Okay. And that was the grain bit. Go ahead. No, I, just, I was just saying, okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And then hops-wise, it was, um, so this is a 16.5-gallon batch, so I don't know, uh, 2.75 ounces of hollow towel and 2 ounces of uh, tentening at 60 minutes, and then a quarter ounce of hollow towel at 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So it's supposed to be at something around like 18 IDs or something like that. What's the guidelines, Brian? Our Brian, Brian Cooper. Yes, uh, long hair, Brian. For the fin- for the 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 gravity. No, or for the IBUs. W- IBUs eighteen to twenty four. Okay, interesting. Sorry. So it's on the lo- it's, it's on the very low end of that. I missed what it what did it. Yeah, which eight, he said about eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It depends on your brewing system. I mean, it's, you know, whatever you're using to, I'm sure you didn't send this to a lab, or maybe you did send it to a lab, but a lot of times, you know, you're calculating, and I find that a lot of the calculations tend to be uh, a little lower than what actually ends up in terms of taste. So I, when I brew, especially a lot of lagers, I tend to go on the lower the lower end as well, and they tend to be, you know, tends to sort of hit, fall into that sweet spot. And, and you know, in a beer that went be malty, too, you rather focus more on the the, you know, the, the lower end and not not yeah. try to like put a lot of hops in it unless you're trying to do something a little different. 
Yeah, that's what I think. I think it tastes hoppier than an eight, or more bitter than an eighteen percent, eighteen IBU. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, uh, let's get to your questions then, man. Go for it. So yeah, I don't know. Well, first I pretty much did everything wrong that you could do with this beer. So I, I froze <laughs> the yeast the day of uh, my brew day. Oh my awesome. god. Yeah, so I, I defrosted my yeast in the middle of my brew day and threw that in there. Oh, yeast can tolerate um, a little abuse sometimes. Yeah, uh, when I mashed, so this might, I don't know, I took this recipe from the um, the homebrew competition. They post the recipes for the, oh, yeah. the winners of the homebrew competition. So nice. I, I took the this year's gold medal recipe and I think last year's gold medal recipe and blended the two, so... One of the recipes, they did a step mash. I'd never done a step mash before, so I figured, why not try it? And I think I did more of a, like a ramped mash. I started low and just slowly ramped up to <laughs> where I wanted to be. How low did you but, start? Uh, the, the, actually, no, uh, in real quick, the, the winner of this year's competition is a, a friend of mine, my, my local homebrew club down in uh, Mountain View. So this one of, I know the person who made, made that beer. Oh, cool. Scott's? Or, yeah, yeah, Scott, yeah, yeah, yeah. He brews some cool. awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah, next time just brew Scott's recipe. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was like, why, why change it? But I don't know. That's me. So it's not no, yeah. So I don't know. I started to make it your own. Definitely. That's kind of a cool way to. Okay. Cool way to go for sure. Yeah. Get some inspiration from. I, I look at those two a lot of times too when I'm forming a recipe. It's kind of fun to see what different things people do that you might not expect, and it's like, oh, that's their little trick in this one. Okay, cool. Yeah, to kind of make it my own, I guess, too. Yeah. So. And so, yeah, my ramp started at one thirty, and then I think I eventually threw, you know, an hour and a half or something, got up to about one fifty. you know. So you and might, I, you I might have kind of a, killed a some first of those, infusion yeah. and a second infusion and then kind of a ramp from there. So it went like one thirty to one forty, and then eventually up to 147. Yeah, if you're anywhere in the upper 120s, one, the low 130s, you, you know, you're going to kill some of those head-forming proteins in that in that temperature range. So you may yeah, try, try a decoction next time. And, and even so, I mean, I don't yeah. think you need to be in the 130s necessarily anyway. I think I would just start in the 140s to, yeah. to kick from there. From I don't think you really need to be in the 130s at all anymore with the modification of malts. Yeah. And I, I agree with Brian. I mean, that's probably where your, the head retention is is suffering from being in that in the 130s. But appearance is only three yeah. points, and then that's yeah, that's a tiny part of it. So, <laughs> yeah, and so for that, so I took the JP method here and just stuck a tube over the faucet and filled these bottles. So there that you might go. Have to do with that, yeah. <laughs> that's my legacy. Yep. <laughs> sometimes it, it works. Yeah. I mean, but you know, so yeah, and sometimes you get that. So, so when you pour this out of your kegerator, do you have do you have a better head retention than the guys experienced? Yeah, I do. I was doing a side by side with you guys. I kept a bottle like you guys suggest, and then pour a glass out of my keg. And yeah, my the glass out of my keg is a, a better head than the okay. bottle version here. Okay, we'll be right over. <laughs> yeah, well, I just tapped that keg. So oh, I think I made a okay. convenient three kegs. That I'll just check check the second keg in you know tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Be back on. All right. Okay, well, uh, wow. very good. Anything else? What did you do with your water? Yeah, I guess. I was curious. Oh, oh water. Okay, yeah. Oh, so for that fast water, so I, I pitched at, um, I think it was 48 degrees and left it there till it was about half fermented, maybe a little bit more, and then I think I took it up to 56 or 58, somewhere in there, I think. Okay. Maybe even a little bit higher. And then let it finish out there, and then I cold crashed it back down uh, to about 34 degrees and left it there for a week and then kegged it. And I think you guys, I think I bottled these ones after it's been in a keg for about three weeks. Okay, so it's not really, I mean, well, anything over 55, I guess, is technically higher than lager, but it's not really. F- yeah, you're not pushing into the 60s with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Most of the esters are really are formed in the, that early stage of fermentation anyway, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. The tr- but I was wondering if that's because I froze the yeast and de thought it the day of, so, you know, excuse <laughs> me. Yeah, I mean, it could have stressed them out a bit and, and there weren't a whole lot, uh, you know, how long did it take to start fermentation? 
I mean, it started up right away, you know. The next morning, things were going, so. All right, well, that's cool. Uh, Seems like your yeast. Was fine. Yeah, the yeast did what it needed to. I don't think there's a yeast yeah. problem here. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder how much of that, the, you know, I mean, lagering is, is essentially just aging. It's a cold fermentation, but it's also aging for a lot longer. So, like, I just did a vena lager, and I did it at 50. I did it at 50 fermentation. And I and I did a dash little rest after like a week or I don't remember how much of fourteen days and then crashed it and left it there for a month. So it's been in the keg for three weeks. So it's like a three month old beer, two month old beer, and it and it's it's very round. It's much rounder than than this. It kind of has those sharp notes that a lot yeah. of the fast lager method tend to have. Yeah, so I wonder is- if that's just. It, just let it. Just leave it alone for another month before you before you start moving it around. Well, yeah, I'm kind of wondering wait. about that. I, I've never done a you know an aged lager like this. So the I, first keg here, I think, by this last glass, it seemed a little bit smoother, and I have two more kegs coming of it. So it'll be interesting nice. to see how it ages out here. Yeah, and that's and that's for me really the the, the point. I, th- I think you you did you basically just rushed a lager. I wouldn't even say you did a fast the the warm lager method because you you know if you didn't get like Brian was saying if you didn't get into the sixties. You know, it's not it's not that bad. Just leave it at forty eight or fifty, and next time, and just know that you're going to be sitting on these for three months before you drink them, and then just make make something real fast uh, to to hold you over. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's basically yeah, I did uh, this beer game day because it was football season. And I needed a, a beer. I could yeah. sit well, back and watch football. Sure you also wanted to drink it some during, like, you know, late September if you could, or even yeah. October. You know, really when Oktoberfest is, you know, <laughs> it's kind of one of those things that. Like Oktoberfest always kind of creeps up on me. I'm like, oh, I want to do an, an Oktoberfest <laughs> or a Meritzen or, or a Fest beer. And I'm like, oh shit, that is only it's only six weeks away. Like, what am I going to do? Sort of thing. And, and they're typically brewed in March, anyways, right? Yeah. I mean, not any, I don't think any more. Not anymore, yeah, these but days. Traditionally, <laughs> I guess. Traditionally. Yeah. So there's six months. Yeah, years. and I, I got a uh, one of my homebrew clubs here. One of the guys had a, a, a you know kept a slurry of his Oktoberfest yeast. So that was the yeast I used in this, which. <laughs> That's one of the big things that kept me away from doing a lager is just the amount of yeast you need. So oh, yeah. I had a yeah, good nice. start on that. I so was, was to, you said Oktoberfest yeast. Was it the 820 for White Labs, or was it someone, some other uh, other strain? What were you using? for? Do you know what the strain was, or was it something else? That you yeah, used it's the uh, Oktoberfest lager blend, white yeast 2633. Hmm. Okay, wow. Never hmm. used that. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, another, another good option there for anybody out there listening um, is if you can get in touch with a local brewer who's a lager brewery, they tend to have more yeast than they'll ever use. And it's more than any, even for ales, it's important to have a, you know, a huge amount of yeast. So if you can you know, bef- you know befriend a lager brewer and, and get their yeast, it's a great way to, to be able to pitch, you know, pitch enough and not have to like buy like six smack packs or whatever for a sixteen gallon batch and make <laughs> right. it a big starter or, or go through like three generations of starters and all that crap. So, um, yeah, it's a good way to do it. Yeah, cool. and then it'll yeah, kind of lager good. in the in the serving vessels too. It's kind of lagering if you have it stored cold. It's lagering in the kegs. <laughs> So it gets yeah, smoother and yeah, so long. I bet that. that I think third... take those other ones. They're sitting on the yeast cake right now in the carboys. Oh, okay. At 34 degrees here. So. Yeah, you probably want to pull those off and get them carved up, carved up and. Yeah, you know, it'll be it'll be totally different. Them. I guarantee that you'll like those better than you will the 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 ones that you kind of pushed into the keg like that. And you should definitely enter these yeah. in competitions too. I mean, I don't know if yeah. you've had yet, but like the the next, you know, the the ones that like JP is talking about, the ones that lager longer, mm-hmm. get in some bottles and, and get in in competition if uh, if you want to win something. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just entered my first competition. I don't know a week or, or I got the results back a week ago or two. So hmm. usually I don't like to share my beer, you know, except with friends here. So sending <laughs> balls away is kind of a, a big deal, right? Right. People I don't know drinking my beer. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been listening to this for a while. It's kind of like a fun idea to send some beers in. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a hoot. It's a hoot. But just don't take the criticism too seriously because you know there's jerks everywhere. Well, hopefully, it's constructive. You know, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, this well, I think there's other beers. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some constructive criticism on those ones, but I think mm, they're yeah. not probably as good as this one. So, absolutely not. Absolutely. Uh, all right, Brian. Uh, if that's it, man, we'll let you. We'll let you get back at it. We appreciate it, guys. Thanks, right. and have a good night. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing the Thanks, Brian. Cool. Overall, it's pretty good beer. I mean, for your yeah. first Meriton, for your yeah. first lager. Yeah, it's great for, for first, first lager. Step wow, mash, yeah. First step yeah. mash, yeast yeah. freeze. Like. And it's another classic style non-IPA beer. Right? 
I was just disappointed it wasn't barrel aged. I was hoping he was going to say he barrel aged and added hazelnut <laughs> yeah. flavor and, and some coffee. <laughs> right. And then re fermented it. And then still entered it as a marriage. Then fermented with yeast <laughs> harvested from my armpits. That's right. Oh, we didn't talk to him about water. Um, and then I'll use my own segue. Speaking of water. Have you guys heard of the iDip? Of course you have. We talk about it all the time because it's a great little product. It's the Smart Brew, made by Smart Brew Water Testing Kit. Incorporates a revolutionary photometer system, which is the first and only one on the market with its own app. It's for home or commercial use, so you can use it in your amateur brewery and use it in your professional brewery. Use it in both if you still do that, whatever you want to do. It's the only meter on the market that runs water tests with no math needed on your part. It pairs via Bluetooth and updates your water results to your own personal water profile. You can email those results to your uh, brew team if you're a professional brewer or put on your Facebook page or put on your uh, brew club's Facebook page if you want to let everybody know what's going on or get some advice on your your water profile the day of. That's pretty cool. You can test for things like total alkalinity, chloride, calcium hardness, pH sulfate, and more. It has the ability to test over 40 different water quality tests with only four mils of water needed for each test. So check it out. Go to smartbrewkit.com, enter TBN10 at checkout. That's TBN for, you know, the Brewing Network. And save 10 bucks on either the standard or the advanced uh, iDip. Yeah, it's a cool toy. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. It's it's uh it's 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 neat, man. I saw yeah. it on at NHC a few years ago, and I was like, God, no. that, every once in a while something will grab you, you know? Yeah. Like, what a cool yeah. thing! I can know right where I'm at on brew day, where my water is. Yeah. Um, all right, we're gonna take another break, and then we're gonna come back and give some stuff away, and then we're gonna get out of here. So uh, hang tight, and we'll uh, you know do our thing. Do you know the three most important rules in brewing? Sanitation, sanitation, and sanitation. And no one does it better than Five Star Chemicals. Five Star knows sanitation. You can only sanitize clean equipment. And Five Star knows how to clean, too. For craft brewers and home brewers, Five Star has what you need to keep your fermenters, serving tanks, kegs and draft lines sparkling and free of any beer-spoiling bacteria. PBW, caustic, acid cleaners, star sand, Santa Clean, lubricants and defoamers, pH stabilizers, and more. Five Star Chemicals has cleaning supplies, safety supplies, heat exchangers, pumps, hoses, and valves. And Five Star is proud to offer eco-friendly products that exceed customer expectations. If you have a cleaning problem, you need the Five Star Solution. Visit FiveStarChemicals.com or call 800-782-7019. 800-782-7019. And get the Five star treatment today are you a member of the white labs customer club if not you should be it's the easiest way to earn free stuff for turning in your old homebrew labels from either vials or pure pitch all you have to do is save your labels and redeem them for things like free yeast an exclusive white labs t-shirt or sweatshirt and even the opportunity to brew with the yeast man himself chris white Signing up is easy. Just go to whitelabs.com slash customer club, fill out the registration form, and then mail in your labels. They will return the favor by sending you awesome White Labs swag. Go sign up today at whitelabs.com slash customer club. White Labs, pure yeast and fermentation since 1995. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we're going to have to pour you out. Back to Dr. Homebrew. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to pretty much I'll just tell you exactly what I said before the break. I said we're going to talk about who won, and then we're going to get out of here. And I, I like doing both of those things. Um, so we had two beers. We had a cream ale and a Merton. And, of course, what we're talking about winning is the Grog Tag $40. At least your beer will look good gift certificate from the fine people at grogtag.com. Check them out. They're lovely people, good supporters of the homebrew scene, and they're supporters of this show. All right. So, um, and we give it out, of course, to the second place um, person based on on our little weird point score here. So, um, Brian, who uh, who gets the forty dollars to grog tag? Our big winner this week is Rich. Rich, all right, dude. Thank you very much. Everybody hard. else gets a gold star and a pat nice. on the back. All right. Let me write this down because if I don't write down Rich, I'll just put dollar signs and then that way I know that it's <laughs> Richie Rich. rich. Um, okay, well, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I want to thank Rich and uh, Brian right. for sending in beers. I think we're going to talk to 
Brian next month. I think he has a couple beers. Huh? Um, also sitting at my house. I think they're kind of some darker beers. So I'm looking forward to that. He said his other beers were crappy. I think. Well, he did want the most feedback on the Meriton. He said he so said his other beers weren't as good. Oh well, you guys are going to really or enjoy he, him. I don't know. Yeah, you're going to really enjoy. Well, him. he entered him in competition, so maybe by next month he'll know what the feedback was on those, <laughs> yeah, and then maybe. we'll be uh, playing off other judges. Maybe that would be uh, we'll that would see. be nice. We'll Speaking see. of nice, uh, the folks at Neshaminy Creek Brewing. They've been around in Philly since 2012. They recently took home their fourth Philly Beer Scene Magazine Award for Brewery of the Year. That's 2014 through 17. And third award for Brewery of the Year, which is pretty cool. Two-time GABF Vienna Style Lager Medal winners in 2013 and 16. They got a gold and a bronze there, respectively, which I love that style. Vienna Lager is mm. so good. Uh, and also a bronze for their smoked lager in 2016. They have a large, expanded, and recently renovated tap room with 24 beers on tap, 18 of which are rotating and seasonal and or limited beers. A variety of styles from hoppy double IPAs to sessionable and poundable lagers to oak fermented saisons and sour beers. Check out com. Good beers, man. I remember when they were on the show. That was good. You know, good everyone time. always looks at me when they talk about Pennsylvania stuff. And it's like, Isn't <laughs> Philadelphia right next, next to Pittsburgh? And here out in California, everything's far away. Yeah. So it makes yeah. it seem like it's close, but it's still five hours to drive from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. That's so we didn't do bad. a lot of driving to Philadelphia and other than the, the G, the, well, sorry, the uh, yeah. NHC. But yeah, it's not, it's not that close. I know what a San Diego IPA tastes like, man. Yeah. No, you know, I need to get out there. Well, I don't live in Pittsburgh, but, you know, yeah. I need to get out there at some point. I have a friend in Philadelphia. I'll go out and see him and uh, hit up that brewery, definitely. Let's go awesome. to Philly. Yeah. I'm a are, uh, yeah, my, well, my cup of tea. When you go, let me know. I'll send an email to Jeremy and, uh, you know, maybe he'll charge you double for beers. <laughs> All right, everybody. It's been Dr. Homebrew, and uh, thank you a lot for tuning in. Um, I don't know. Check out some of the other shows on the Brew Network while you wait for the next episode of Dr. Homebrew to post. Send us some beer. Send us some beer. Email jp at thebrewnetwork.com. I have a huge, I have like six months now of a backlog. Really? More lagers? <laughs> not as many barrel so. aged beers? Uh, <laughs> I hope so, man. Start uh, making a lager now. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.